My name is Tim Armstrong, I'm Head of Department at Royal Holloway University of London. I'm going to talk today about The Return of the Soldier, Rebecca Liss's text about shell shock in the First World War. It's written in 1918 on the borders of the war, so it's unusual in that respect. Uh, it doesn't involve waiting for time to pass before people talk about the traumatic events. And the reason for that is partly because it is about women, of course, who wait at home and experience the war through the imagination of what's happening to those involved. This is a text about time travel. The novel's dedicatee is J, which stands for Jaguar, who was in fact H.G. Wells, um, Rebecca Liss's lover at the time, and author, of course, of The Time Machine. So this is a book about time travel. And the text you might compare it with in that respect is Washington Irving's Rip Van Winkle, a story about someone who sleeps through the traumatic events of the American War of Independence and wakes up into the new world of the Republic. So Chris returns amnesiac from the First World War and we're told all the inhabitants of this new track of time were his enemies. He runs into things in the house that have been there, placed there in the last 10 years. Strangeness had come into the house and everything was appalled by it, even time, we're told. And his memories centre on Monkery Island, which is an island in time. Um, it's an 18th century folly, in fact. Um, the word shock in the novel is used to describe Chris's shell shock, but the only other time it's used is to describe what doesn't happen on Monkey Island. The trees move not like timber shocked by wind, we're told. So it's a place outside of time and free from shock. Now Chris's displacement may be attributed vaguely to shell shock in the novel. I don't think West has a very strong understanding of that. But clearly he, he, he suffers from a broader sense of shock, um, one linked to modernity generally. The novel's written against the context of the decline of the minor gentry. Chris has to go to work in the city in order to provide enough money to keep it all going. And as Jenny eventually comes to understand in the novel, he, he hates the aggressive modernity, which is represented by his own wife, Kitty. Kitty, who changes the house and fills it with knickknacks, uh, who's described by Jenny as, as, as being like someone who has a, who's, who's like the cover of a magazine. Um, so Chris is in flight not just from the war but from a much longer tract of time. For me one of the most interesting bits of lost or displaced time in the text is the parcel of 12 letters from Chris that Margaret keeps in her drawer. Letters that she only belatedly collected when she returned to Monkey Island years after the shared moment of passion there, but which she never read out of loyalty to her husband. So she goes upstairs and reads them when she gets Chris's letter and must confront her own trauma, her own lost past, um, which is at that point newly alive to her like a wound. So that's one of the many bits of displaced time in the novel. You, you have to remember that everything in the story is focalised through and narrated by Jenny, who despises Kitty and loves Chris, who thinks of him with what she calls the passion of exile. Jenny is the romancier who fills in the missing bits of the story of Monkey Island. She tells us that she doesn't get the last day, she wasn't told it, but she nevertheless narrates it, including that near mythical vision of the heron rising from the water, which, which is one of the keynotes of that bit of narration. So it's this passion which she shares with Margaret, which she expresses through Margaret, which places shell shock at the center of the novel. What's involved is the sharing of states between bodies. She says at one point, I who had felt his agony like a wound in my own body. And that wound may come in a displaced way from a letter, from a telegram, but at the centre of the novel is that notion of the absorption of pain. At the end of chapter four, Jenny says of Margaret, I saw her arms brace him under the armpits with a gesture that was not passionate, but rather the movement of one carrying a wounded man from under fire. And then later she says of Margaret, we kiss, not as women, but as lovers do. I think that we each embrace that part of Chris the other, and have absorbed by her love. So what's involved there is the exchange of states of sympathy, 
states of bodily being, which ultimately have their origin in Chris's trauma. But there's a clue to this exchange of affect and of trauma between bodies, even um, as it relates to the war, even at the beginning of the novel, um, when we're told that um, joke, um, we were all of us in a barn one night, and a shell came along. My pal sang out, help me, old man. I've got no legs. I had to answer. I can't, old man. I've got no hands. So that sense of bodies exchanging trauma is there, even at the level of the novel's um, black humour. What cures Chris and restores his memory? It's not as though he doesn't know his own case, that there's a war on, that he's lost his memory. In part, What's involved is simply a collective decision on the part of Jenny and Margaret that he must not be marooned in an island in time, that he's not that he not be akin to a child playing in the sun, and those repeated images of peering at children under hedges, watching them play, uh, under, underlie that sense of a responsibility for the for the, the man who's rented child life. So, so what's the significance of his memory of his lost son, a memory shared with Margaret in another traumatic exchange when she presses the photo of the boy to her breast as though to staunch a wound, we're told. The significance lies, it seems to me, in the relation of all this to Kitty. Um, she's the child who must finally be cared for. Her pain, because it cannot be morally shared, because it's purely self, self-referential, must be assuaged. The novel's ending. Kitty whispers, he's cured. That's an interesting word. It relates to the Latin word for cure and raises the question of whether Chris has been cared for, as Jenny wonders. But it also means to harden the skin. Has Chris been hardened enough to return to the front? It's at the end of the novel that we get the fullest description of the war, of that flooded trench in Flanders under that sky full of flying death and that no man's land where bullets fall like rain on the rotting faces of the dead. At that point, Chris must return to the war and possibly return to his own death. So we're presented with a situation where finally his cure has resulted in a hardening that allows him to return to the front. It's interesting that it's at the end of the novel that we get the fullest description of the war from Jenny of that flooded trench in Flanders under that sky more full of flying death than clouds, and that no man's land where bullets fall like rain on the rotten faces of the dead. So you might say that at the end of the novel, for Chris, it's simply a return to the front, cured with that gap in time, that, 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 that traumatic cut in time, cured. But for Margaret, and, and for Jenny, there's a different set of questions which relate to Chris and the continuity of his life and whether he's been cured for. So I think you have to think very much about the perspective of the different women involved at the end of the text.